directly to our next speaker, uh, somebody I've known for a number of years. He's uh, been the president of uh, what was originally NARP, now is the Rail Passengers Association, and he has spoken to us before, and uh, hopefully he has a list of uh, some positive developments of what's going on uh, nationwide, and um, other news and uh, items of uh, activism in order to uh, improve passenger rail throughout the country. So I'd like to welcome Jim Matthews, the president of the Rail Passengers Association. Gary, thank you. Uh, and Bruce, as always, thank you for the uh, behind the scenes, behind the curtain wizardry. Um, afternoon, everybody. Um, normally right now, we would be finishing up our dessert in a great little place in Schenectady. Uh, I hope maybe uh, next year we'll be doing exactly that. Uh, but for now, um, Gary's absolutely right. What a great time to be involved in passenger rail advocacy. Um, you know, the, the, the joke really is, you know, how much more winning can we take, right? <laughs> but in this case, it's, it's really quite true. Um, we, now is everybody seeing this giant sort of presentation view instead of? Uh, yeah, all, all good, Jim, you're good. Yes. Okay. Yes, we're good. All right, super. Um, so what a great time uh, and, and so much good news. Uh, at the same time, there's also some risks. And I think uh, as I, I go around the country virtually on Zoom, I've done a whole bunch of these so far, it's that season. Um, one thing I'm finding, and, and we need to fight back against this, is complacency. There's a sense that, oh, we got the bipartisan infrastructure law, we got $66 billion for rail, we might get up to $103 billion for rail. We're sitting pretty and we're good. That is so far from the truth. Um, you know, now is where the, the, the work really does begin. And we need uh, ESPA, we need all over Washington, all over Ohio, you name it. Every, this is the time for uh, all of the, the state level organizations um, to really shine because a lot of this work is now going to shift to the states. So let's start with some key dates. Um, the upcoming uh, Rail Passengers Association Spring Meeting in uh, Washington, D.C. It's actually in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, we uh, would normally do our day on the hill activities. Congress uh, really does not want to see people in person. Um, so we'll be doing uh, most of the congressional visits online. There will be a very small group of us that will go visit the hill um, but for the most part, they will be online meetings. Um, another key date, uh, March 28th was when Amtrak service was supposed to return to normal after the uh, COVID cuts. Well, as we know, uh, so much for that. Uh, we are still working on that, but um, now that's looking more like a May date. Um, May 14th, this is an incredibly important date and everybody here should write this down. May 14th is 180 days after passage of the Infra Investment in Infrastructure and Jobs Act, which became the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. On that day, we're going to see all the documentation about establishment of the Corridor Identification and Development Program. Uh, DOT owes Congress its report on direct grants to Amtrak, and we will be establishing the Food and Beverage Service Working Group, which is, again, in the law. It has to be done. And we've been working very closely with Amtrak uh, almost since the day the bill was signed to sort of work out what that looks like and how we're going to support that. Um, September 20th is the very last primary as we head into the midterm elections. Why is that important? Well, because that tells you that really this summer is going to be a campaign summer. And so a lot of meaningful work on the advocacy side, at least when it comes to legislatures, is probably going to come to a screeching halt somewhere in the middle of the summer and um, really through September 20th um, and then up to election day, that's, that's going to be it. So we have a very compressed legislative season in which all of us can work. October 1st is when the new fiscal year comes along, fiscal 23. And of course, the midterms are on November 8th. So first things first, yes, we are working hard uh, with Congress to push to restore service as soon as possible. Uh, Congress has made it very clear that the reason they wrote the bill the way they did and they funded it the way they did is because they expected the service to be the way it used to be. And uh, we all know what the problems are. Uh, Amtrak didn't invent COVID. Uh, Amtrak didn't invent the Great Resignation. 
Um, so some of this is just not Amtrak's fault. Um, Amtrak complicated matters for itself uh, with the furloughs in the middle of, of COVID, but you know that's, that's water under the bridge. There's nothing Amtrak or we can do about that. The issue now is getting people in the door and hired. And, and once that happens, we can start to turn the trains back on. Um, we're gonna continue to, to work with um, Congress and with Amtrak to ensure that these service disruptions don't become the pattern. It would be very easy to fall into a winter doldrums pattern where the ridership goes down to say, you know, let's just go back to five days for a couple of months and just kind of take it easy. That's not what Congress intended when it uh, passed this law. It's certainly not what we intended as we helped to write this law. And it's certainly not what passengers around the country expect. So we're gonna work very hard to make sure that this doesn't become a repeating pattern. Um, the news on the partial restoration, yeah, that was a start. Um, it's better than nothing, better than zero, um, but it does remain disappointing. Um, I've been accused on all of the various uh, rail fan forums of being obsessed with the Surface Transportation Board proceeding in the Gulf Coast to the exclusion of things like dining cars or salt in the hot dogs. Um, I'm gonna tell you flat out, guys, if you're not obsessed with this, you're not paying attention. This case will determine if all of the things that we've worked for for decades and all this money that is in the bipartisan infrastructure law will be able to be spent to expand the services, which we say we all want. Um, this case is that important. Um, what is at stake here is reaffirming the obligation of host railroads to allow Amtrak trains to have access to those rights of way. And we have to make sure that a fair and transparent process for Amtrak access comes out of this hearing. And we have to make sure that whatever decision results out of the Service Transportation Board, it's bulletproof. It can't be overturned on the merits. And we wanna make sure that uh, if, if anything were to happen, um, those, the, the file, the docket of information will be chock full on the merits. It won't be an issue. Um, and basically, uh, anyone who's followed along will see that the, the CSX claims just don't hold water. Uh, and a whole parade of witnesses has already uh, told uh, the Service Transportation Board in open hearings that they don't hold water and that they've been pretty wildly manipulated. Um, the evidentiary hearing has been moved. It was supposed to take place uh, really this week. Uh, it is now uh, moved to April 4th and 5th. Um, that will be very much, it will look a lot like what you see on TV in a, in a in a trial. There will be witnesses. Those witnesses will make direct statements. They will be uh, examined uh, by their attorneys and the opposing side's attorneys can cross-examine those witnesses. And so it's gonna look a lot like a trial. Uh, and at the end of it, um, it is the, that proceeding and the documentation filed by the parties to the proceeding that will determine the decision. The rest of the hearings, the stuff we filed, the stuff that you filed, all that is it's helpful. It establishes the, the desire, but it is not the basis of the decision. The decision must be narrowly based on the evidence that is presented by the four parties in the case and by uh, the evidence that is and testimony that's developed in that hearing. That's it. So let's start with uh, fiscal 2022-23. Thursday night, $1.5 trillion of funding bill to get us to the rest of fiscal 2022. Uh, we didn't get everything, but we got a lot. Um, the appropriations late, I mean, it's five months late. Um, and it did not fully fund the rail programs at authorized levels. Um, we were hoping that it would. We were trying to set that as a precedent that this is, we're gonna take those authorized levels and hit them each time. Um, the reality was because of the timing and the way all this set up, you know, the, the uh, T-HUD, the, the appropriators had already set up a blueprint um, before the BIL, before the, the bipartisan infrastructure law. It was never likely that they were gonna just rip up that blueprint and go with the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, really, fiscal 23 is gonna be the real test. And this is where advocates can and should help. Remember, the bipartisan infrastructure law has some guaranteed money in it, and then we have to get the rest of it through regular appropriations those appropriations were authorized at much higher levels than in the past, but we have to wait each year to get those appropriations. And that means we have to shift our focus to the appropriators 
to try to get what we want and need. But overall, it was meaningful progress. Uh, there was a 486% increase in uh, passenger rail funding over fiscal 21 enacted numbers. Um, pay attention to the grant programs, guys. Um, the, the big winner here was the Federal State Partnership for Intercity Passenger Rail. It's a grant program. They got $7.3 billion to fund new and upgraded passenger service uh, via competitive grants. So let's look at some tables. Uh, I don't expect everybody to, to kind of memorize this. We will be handing out the, the slides, I guess, Bruce, right? You're going to distribute to everybody. Okay. Um, so you guys will be able to, to take a look at this at uh, your leisure. Um, but the point of this is, is to sort of separate out the guaranteed money, which is that sort of orange uh, set of columns, and the, uh, the appropriation, uh, which is that blue set of columns. But when you add it together, um, we're talking about $16.5 billion uh, for, uh, pass for, for rail uh, in, in fiscal 22. Now, stop and think about that. That's actually an extraordinary amount of money for the programs that we care about. Uh, it's certainly uh, more money than we've ever seen before. And this can continue uh, during the, the life of the bill. So this is a huge win, but we need to make sure it's spent correctly and not frittered away on just studies and hand-waving. So it's a very complicated bill structure. It, it took kind of three bills and stuck it together and combined a few things and made some guaranteed and some not. So I think it's worth taking just a minute to sort of step people through uh, the various bits and pieces here. A lot of people have sort of in shorthand looked at the bipartisan infrastructure law and said, oh, $66 billion for Amtrak. Not exactly. Uh, there's $66 billion in total funding. Um, $42 billion of that is going to be administered by the Federal Railroad Administration in the form of competitive grants. So Amtrak is still going to get a boatload of money compared to the money that it used to get. So there will be plenty for, for Amtrak to, to do, and, and Amtrak will get a good running head start on a lot of very long neglected uh, needs. Um, but that is not uh, of money. The, the Chrissy grants, the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and uh, Safety Improvements, um, $5 billion in there, um, that's guaranteed. Uh, rail crossing uh, elimination, $3 billion guaranteed in there. The Federal State Partnership for Intercity Passenger Rail, that's $36 billion. Um, and so if you look at, oh, and the Restoration and Enhancement Grant, um, that's relatively small compared to the rest of it. However, if you look at the way restoration and enhancement had been funded in the past, this is still an enormous increase uh, over uh, the, the previous version of that, that program. Here's another way to look at it. Um, here's how the uh, money for the, the uh, Northeast Corridor and the National Network kind of split out. Um, the boxes that are in green, and I hope you can see that on the screen, that's FRA discretionary grant. The boxes in black, that's a direct grant to Amtrak. Um, so no matter how you slice it, it's a lot more money than Amtrak has ever had, but it is not the entire pot. Uh, and that's an important point. And that's, this is why it's important for the state organizations to start really stepping up and paying attention to these programs as they roll out, because there's going, they're gonna be competitive. They're gonna involve the need to identify local stakeholders and um, they're, they're going to go to the, to the folks that are the, the sharpest and the best organized with the best programs, the best projects, the nearest term wins, and the appropriate support at political levels to get them done. So my big takeaway that I hope everyone comes away with, um, and I've, I've said this to all of Ohio, I've said it to the Michigan Association of Rail Passengers, I'm saying it to ESPA, I'll say it to every state organization I talk to. We have to find state and local stakeholders that are capable of advancing projects. Uh, the $22 billion that Amtrak gets in direct grants, they're limited to state of good repair. So great things. These are things that we've all, as advocates, been shaking our fists about. Um, you know, if anyone watched me testify before the House a couple of years ago, um, as this bill was coming together, um, I complained about the rolling museum that we're all ro rolling around on. Uh, there's money in here for new rolling stock. There's money in here for state supported services. There's money in here to fix ADA, you know, to bring the stations up to, to ADA compliance, deferred capital, um, all these kinds of things. 
but that's that's state of good repair. The corridor expansion and upgrades, in other words, the new cool services, the new lines on the map that we want to see, or the additional frequencies that we want to see, that's going to require state and local entities to apply for competitive grants. And that's mainly through that federal state partnership program that I talked about earlier. Um, corridors that are not in the long distance study, this is an important caveat, corridors that are not included in the FRA's long distance study will need to find a local sponsor, I'm willing to put up at least 20% local funding match. Now, local means a lot of things. The state could be all kinds of things, all kinds of political subdivisions. Um, but that's gonna be very important. And that's why there was a lot of discussion in the past few weeks about who's in the study and who's not in the study. The North Coast Hiawatha route, for example, uh, which is the, the Big Sky uh, Passenger Rail Authority's proposal to restore service on the North Coast Hiawatha between Seattle, and Chicago, uh, dipping down south through, through Montana. Um, that's going to be in the study. That's important because it's corridors that are not included in the study that will need to find a local sponsor. Uh, and there have been, there's been a lot of uh, hand-wringing I've seen on the rail fan forums that the law prohibits any service that wasn't on the original map. Uh, well, that's not FRA's interpretation. We've had a, several meetings with them about this and about North Coast in particular, and that has not been their interpretation. Um, so eligible applicants for these state, group of states, an interstate compact, something like the Southern Rail Commission or the Midwest uh, Interstate Passenger Rail Commission, a public agency, publicly chartered authority established by one or more states, Political subdivision or subdivisions, so a group of counties could form a, a little group of folks. Um, Amtrak acting on its own behalf or under a cooperative agreement with one or more states. All of those are eligible applicants for these grant funds. Um, we're probably going to see the very first notice of funding opportunity this summer. Um, that's called a NOFO. We're going to start to introduce the vocabulary here because everyone needs to kind of be have their ears and be ready to, to and be prepared to respond right away. Um, when these NOFOs happen this summer, it is going to be so important for ESPA to engage with local, state, and municipal sponsors the day it comes out. You should probably start meeting now with people saying, we anticipate the NOFO. Here's some of our thoughts. Let's all keep working together so that we can be appropriately responsive when they come out. Um, it's short notice. I get it. You know, it's March and we're talking about a couple of months from now. So you may miss that window, but there will be a steady stream of funding opportunities over the, the five-year life of the bipartisan infrastructure law, unless a new Congress comes along and begins to claw that money back. That is a genuine risk. Don't sleep on that risk because that could happen. That we're already starting to see rumblings about that. Uh, so we need to be careful about that. Um, we're working very hard with DOT to make sure that they meet deadlines that are in the bill. Um, you know, the, the big fear is a kind of repeat of, uh, you know, uh, the ARA program where a lot of deadlines slipped, a lot of studies got done, there was a lot of hand waving, and in the end, not a lot of, you know, meaningful work. Um, we, Sean and I have met, I've lost track of how many times now with uh, FRA, uh, various working groups within FRA um, to help understand what the roadblocks might be to getting programs done quickly, to getting studies done quickly, to getting working groups organized and off the ground so that meaningful progress can be made quickly. FRA absolutely shares that goal. Um, I've, they've said it on the record, but they've also said it even more forcefully off the record, um, that they don't want to make those kinds of mistakes that we've seen in the past. They recognize they need to move quickly, and they're looking to groups like ours and yours to help make that happen. Um, so a very important program is the Corridor Identification and Development Program. That's Section 22308 in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, now, we've been working, um, we, we did supply some stuff to, to Steve and, uh, and to Gary. Uh, we worked with some of the other uh, ARPs as well um, to respond uh, to a 
quarter ID request for information from the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, a lot of people got confused by this. They thought this was supposed to be your list of your wish list of quarters. Well, no, that's not actually what this was. This was more about how should FRA structure its program to ensure that it gets a good mix of corridors, that it gets solidly funded and well thought out proposals. They're looking to make sure that the proposals that come into the pipeline are not crazy, that they are supportable, executable, things that will actually succeed. Um, they asked us about what is the appropriate role for Amtrak and FRA? How should they balance? Should the service development plans be longer range planning documents? Um, how do we make sure the public really gets involved? That this doesn't just happen behind closed doors. This, this isn't just people drawing lines on a map and getting excited and then the, the public just has to kind of wait and see what comes out of it. Um, what should the pipeline look like? What should it take to get into the pipeline? What should it get to take to be at the front of the line? How should we prioritize projects? These are all really important and they sound wonky and, and, and detailed, but if you stop and think about it, these are the questions that are going to determine which things get on the map and which don't. Uh, so it's really important to get these, these items right. Um, so the written comments, the RFI, they were due this week. They were due on March 9th. We submitted ours. Uh, I think, um, Steve Strauss, I think you guys filed as well. Did you not? We absolutely yeah. did. We, we submitted, yes, we Jim. Did. Yep. I, I assumed that you did. I hadn't seen your filing. I think maybe Sean did. Um, but yeah, this is this is great. Um, so the next step, having done that, is you got to monitor the execution very closely. Um, FRA is going to be doing a ton of outreach sessions, public meetings. They'll they may reach out to you individually for uh, follow up and feedback on your responses to the RFI. Um, so what they're looking to see is real engagement from the communities and representatives of the communities in the process. They want to see that enthusiasm. Um, and that's not just kind of, you know, philosophical. We've seen examples in Wisconsin of what happens when you start throwing money at a program and the support really isn't there to get it done. So trying to avoid that, FRA is trying to avoid that. Um, and so be prepared to, to continue the conversation with these, with these folks at FRA. They really do want to hear it and they really will be guided by a lot of what we say. Um, what we had told everybody was that in, in your comments, you should show near-term benefits, use work already done in the past studies, because there's a bunch of work that's already been done. Um, the Amtrak Connects Us plans, the FRA regional rail plans, high-speed rail plans, um, state rail plans. Um, and we need to make sure that whatever pipeline is created, it's not just a bunch of little lines, but that there's a larger vision to connect the entire country a national vision for intercity passenger rail. Um, I, that was certainly the, the bulk of what our comments were. Um, our comments we put up on, on the rail passengers website so everybody can read our detailed responses to uh, all of, all of the, the questions that were in the RFI. I'd encourage you to go read it um, because we really do think that that's kind of a good framework for, for all of us to be thinking about how to respond. Um, as these things roll out, because we're going to continue to have to respond as, as FRA remains engaged in the process. This is not going to be one of those things where they take the input and then go into a room and close the door and we don't hear from them again for two years. That's just not how this is going to operate. And I'm very pleased with that. I think that's great. Um, but it also, there's an implicit bargain that they are making with all of us as advocates, you know, where we said, we really want to be at the table. We want to be part of this. So they're kind of calling our bluff. They're saying, okay, you're going to be a partner, be a partner. We're going to keep asking you for stuff and you need to be prepared to supply it. Uh, so that's kind of all on us now to make good on the promises that we've made um, to be good partners and to be able to, to offer thoughtful, reflective, um, and useful guidance as these programs come together. Because it's a lot of money. Never had money like this for rail before. And everybody wants to make sure it gets spent the right way. Uh, as I said, Rail Nation uh, DC is coming up. Uh, Administrator Bose is going to be our keynote speaker uh, from the FRA. Uh, we will also have um, the chairman of the Service Transportation Board, um, Marty Oberman. He's going to be our luncheon speaker. Uh, we're going to have Amtrak leadership there as well. Uh, I uh, was pretty insistent with Amtrak that um, 
however we do this uh, during our meeting, we want to make sure there's attention paid to equipment uh, because a lot of our folks care very much about the status of the locomotives and new rolling stock and what's happening with superliner replacement and all those kinds of issues. Um, and so we're, we're going to make sure that, that those issues get covered during our, our meeting. Um, but the centerpiece of our, our experience this time is going to be our workshops. Um, it's very clear that as this work spins up that I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, um, people are going to have to be able to roll up their sleeves and, and be part of the process. And that's a lot more than just sitting down with an old timetable from 1954 and saying, wouldn't it be great if it looked like this? Um, we really have to be professionals. We have to roll up our sleeves. We have to do our homework and be good partners. And that means we're going to work on how to, to create dozens of project and corridor specific working groups on our council of representatives, our supporters, ESPA, all of Washington, all of Ohio, you name it. Um, because we want to make sure that we draw our, our political map as well as we draw our corridor map, because those two things have got to align. We learned that lesson the last time around when money got unspent and projects just sat because the political did not line up with the, the service map. Um, we're also going to do a workshop on customer service and the passenger. Uh, participants are going to work on how to structure an internal working group to generate recommendations and respond to requests. Um, this, is, this is actually learning the process of how to be good advisors to Amtrak on customer service and the passenger. Um, and so these will be hands-on, um, these will be roll up your sleeves kind of things, and you'll, you should walk out with, with an actual tool bag full of stuff of knowing what to do and how to be helpful. Uh, registration is still open. If you're uh, thinking about coming down, please come down. Uh, railpassengers.org slash DC. Uh, I went through that quickly because I know every time I've done this in person, um, by this time the dessert is gone and people have lots of questions and we always run out of time for questions. So I'm gonna do my very best to be here for questions. So I hope that was uh, not too fast, but uh, Bruce, I guess uh, over to you. Okay, uh, thanks, Jim. Good to see you. you too. Uh, looks like the weather's uh, beautiful there in DC today. But, uh, <laughs> I know that's your background, but uh, <laughs> a little snow uh, here in upstate New York. Are, are you seeing snow today, or I don't know where you're at at the moment. So it, uh, well, it, it's funny. Um, you know, the the folks in DC. You know, beautiful seventy degree day earlier this week, and now there's snow. And of course, in DC, unlike upstate New York, where, as most of you know, I grew up in upstate New York, where snow is something that happens in winter. Um, in DC, snow is like a hurricane or a tornado. It's a natural disaster. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's full on panic down in DC. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so we do have some questions. Again, uh, I encourage folks, if you do have a question for Jim, please type it into the question box. Uh, I will answer one already. Uh, are today's PowerPoints going to be available? Yes, Jim's going to send them to me, and then we'll make them available. Uh, that's correct, Jim, right? That, uh, yep, you, that's what yep. we said at the beginning. Right. I'm going to send them to Bruce, and Bruce will send them to you. We'll get them out uh, onto the ESPA website and uh, so other channels, so yes, they will be available. Uh, there are questions about uh, the upcoming uh, spring meeting about remote access. And I know <laughs> that's maybe still a work in progress, Jim, but whatever update you can provide to be helpful. I, I, I'm happy to do it. Um, if, if, any of them, if anyone has been reading the um, sort of the running blog post about what's happening with the spring meeting, what I said in the very beginning was be flexible. Um, you know, this is our first in-person meeting since 2019. Um, COVID is still an issue. Um, if you had asked me in January whether we would be ready to rock and roll by the end of March, I would have said, yeah, we're ready to rock and roll. Omicron came along and kicked everybody in the pants. Um, and so it's pretty, I don't, this, this, this may come off the wrong way. It's relatively easy to do a Zoom meeting. We know how to do it. We've done a bunch of them. It's relatively easy to do. It's actually not cheap. We get the webinar version. We have to spend money on an extra license and there's things to do, but we know how to do that. 
Likewise, um, we know how to do an in-person meeting. Um, and that's a, it's a complicated thing. It's a lot of heavy lifting. It's a lot of people behind the scenes doing a lot of stuff, but we know how to do that. What's hard is a hybrid. And that's kind of where we're, we're inching right now. Um, and that's a very difficult thing. Um, the hotel has to be able to support all the bandwidth that we need to get that done. Um, right now, they're not entirely certain they can. Um, so we may only be able to do some things online and not all things online. Um, it'll be very hard to do uh, anything other than the sort of council business meeting live. Our intent is to uh, record some of the, the speakers and the presentations so that um, folks can play those back later on. Um, voting on council business and that sort of thing, that will be available in person at the meeting and online. Um, please don't ask me about the details on how we're going to merge those two things as the votes get tallied. Um, there is a process and we've been reviewing it and it's gonna be fairly hairy, um, but it will get done. Um, so the council business meeting portion, um, we're going to uh, try to sort of quote stream that. Um, the other parts of the, the meeting will not be live, but they will be electronic later. So it's a little confusing, but I hope it makes sense. And then of course, as I said earlier, we had intended to have people visit Congress in person, but almost everybody who tried to make a, a, an appointment to visit with their congressional delegation was told, well, you know, we'd rather do Zoom. Um, so Congress has, has really embraced the idea of Zoom meetings. In some ways, I think it's a better way to do it. We've had much better communications with our congressional folks on Zoom than we ever did in person, weirdly enough. Um, so that's kind of how that's going to go. Um, so that, so it's, a, it's kind of a mixed bag. And I, I know everybody would love for us to just have everything written out on a schedule months in advance. It says this is how it's going to be done. Um, but COVID numbers change daily. And until last week, COVID was killing more Americans than any other cause of death, including um, heart disease or strokes or uh, anything like that. So I mean, everybody's just trying to adjust and everyone's just kind of trying to um, roll with it a little bit. And so are we, uh, but that's kind of how that's gonna play out. And, and I hope that, I know that's not a perfect answer, but it's the answer that, that we can do. Well, the, uh, the, there are several questions, but uh, people are already responding. Thank you, Jim, for that. Does that, uh, uh, and uh, having been obviously part of the behind the scenes, I can only imagine what is going on uh, with that. Uh, I was going to say, I think I think Bruce is getting PTSD just just having me talk about it. So yeah, exactly right. It, uh, I can only think. Uh, let's see what other questions. So if there are other questions more on the broad policy side, please type them in. Jim will be happy to respond. Uh, there, of course, is a question about the ever popular topic of food service. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. So let's go back to, where is that slide? Uh, that would have been slide. It, it, one of me, these slides, I, yeah. one of these slides, I pointed out that we are part of the food and beverage working group. Right. Um, and I can't find the slide number, but we are part of, we were written into the law as participants in the food and beverage working group. Um, and we are endeavoring to get folks involved who either have done food service before, uh, particularly on a train or in that kind of an environment, um, food suppliers, um, but also passengers with particular needs. So we're looking for people, we're, we're gonna be uh, trying to include people who um, you know, have special dietary issues, people who are disabled, people with wheelchairs, because all of these, I mean, if you stop and think about it, how do I get my powered wheelchair into the dining car, right? I mean, the way that the, the tables are set up in a cross-country cafe, for example, that's all fixed and you can't really do that. <laughs> so the, all of these issues play into it. Um, they are, they know what they have to do. The law was very clear on what they have to do. Um, the, the challenge is to make sure that the working group is made up of people 
who can uh, help work through solutions and not just um, offer their own private menu selections as their favorites. Uh, it's a lot bigger problem than that. There's a logistical problem. There's how do you get food onto the train? How do we make sure that the quality stays high uh, when they rolled out traditional dining, uh, which was an improved product from where it was before um, on the Western trains. It was great and people were taking pictures and sharing them online. Look at this beautiful thing. Um, and then as the months wore on and COVID took a toll and supply chains became a problem, some of the, the shine wore off of that and some of those products were not coming out as well as they did in the beginning. And one of the things we said at the time was Amtrak is not gonna roll that out to the rest of the system until they figured out how to deliver it cleanly, well, highly executed across the board. And they're still trying to figure that out. And anybody who's experienced that on one of the Western trains will know that that's true. Um, so those are the kinds of issues that have to be, um, that have to be addressed. Um, at the same time, we, as I said, Amtrak reached out to us almost immediately and we gave them a multi-page set of recommendations on how to structure the committee, how to put people onto the committee or the working group, I should say, not the committee, um, the kinds of things that would be uh, relevant to the restrictions in the law, because that's the other thing people have to recognize is that the law was set up to solicit certain kinds of answers and that's what the working group has to stick to um, and how to make sure that it stays on time that they're able to deliver something real to congress because congress has imposed a deadline and said you will report to the congress by this date um, which is one year so this this has to happen we are involved um, they will do the amtrak will will get it done on time we'll get it opened up on time um, and we, as I said, one of the, the workshops that we're running is about identifying people and methods of getting that feedback into the process so that those voices and those concerns are fed into the working group. And it's not just, you know, one or two people kind of hitting their own opinions. Uh, let's let's uh, change the vein for a second. Uh, there are several questions, uh, both in the chat and some other sources, about uh, getting new board members nominated to the Amtrak board and concern about that. Um, I can tell you that the existing board members are very concerned about that. A lot of them are uh, are uh, have already turned into a pumpkin. Um, the yeah, no, it's an it's an enormous issue. Uh, and if you look at the difficulties that the Biden administration had, even getting Administrator Bose confirmed, um, who was about as, as non-controversial a nominee as you could possibly imagine. Um, but that, that nomination got held up. Uh, and so now that we have um, not just COVID, but a war, and the administration is not exactly focusing on getting a whole raft of board appointments before the U.S. Senate to try to get it done. It is important. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying that we haven't seen a whole lot of movement um, about getting uh, the White House to throw in a raft of names. Um, we have been asked in the past, almost a year ago now, um, for uh, names of folks that we, uh, that we would endorse. We've done that. Uh, we had a few folks uh, raise their hands to us and say, hey, I would like to be on the board. I'd like to talk to you about whether you would endorse my, my candidacy. And we've had those interviews with folks and, and we have put some names forward based on those conversations. So all that is happening. Um, but now we're waiting for the White House to, to make the nominations. And um, I, I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of impetus for getting this done. But it has to happen, right? I mean, we, we can't, with all this money getting ready to come out of the pipe, um, it, this is not a time to, to lack the, the sort of committed leadership that we need at, at the top of the organization. Uh, and so uh, I, it's crucial. I think it's very important. I just don't see it happening here. I don't see any evidence of it happening, um, certainly not as quickly as I would like. Uh, there are certainly some board, current board members who have been on for a long time, so I'm sure some of them are uh, looking for some opportunity to uh, 
what are you they talking are. about from that? There, there's, there's a few that want to stay and, and we're fine with that. Um, but there's also a few that are like, okay, I, I've, I've done my bit for, for, you know, God and country and it's, it's time for someone else. Um, so those opportunities are there. Okay. Gary. Gary Prophet. Yes. Yes. Anything for Jim? Um, I, I've touched everything. I think that. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say. I think you've uh, looked through. I was just looking through the chat to see if there's any other uh, any other topics. Um, the only thing is with the you had mentioned. Uh, I know there's a zillion things on food service, but the working group on food service is that to. I mean, what's the overall purpose? What to. Okay. Let you me, ultimately on dining cars or what to do in the cafe car or just analyzing everything on how best to do it going forward? Because I know you have the constant argument that, you know, some customers say, don't serve me crap from 7-Eleven. And then you got other customers that say, oh, I want a five course dinner. And then you got everything in between. But I mean, my personal perspective is, you know, the last couple of times on the Lakeshore Limited, it's like, don't give me food that's going to make me not want to take the train again, which is a different attitude than giving me food that's going to make me want to take the train again. So, I mean, there's different ways of looking at that. Well, there are, and, and you've almost, Gary, you've almost kind of outlined the problem um, that, that management faces. Um, you know, you got a lot of different people taking the train for a lot of different reasons at a lot of different price points and for a lot of different durations. And there's an enormous difference between taking a two hour and 47 minute ride between New York and Washington on the Acela and a two day and, and you know, four hour ride across the country on you know, one of the, the Western trains. Um, so you, there is no such thing as one size fits all. And, and that's hard to do. Um, the, the reason this came about, the working group came about, this was written into the law. Um, this is not just Amtrak saying, gee, wouldn't it be nice to have a food and beverage working group? This was Congress tired of hearing complaints and tired of not getting action out of Amtrak when they made those complaints saying, fine, you're going to create a working group. It's going to include stakeholders and passengers and people who eat the food. It's not just going to be an internal product. And the purpose of this working group is going to be to examine food and beverage and onboard service from and, and see what is possible and what is not possible. And it's going to be thorough and, and it's going to take into account not just gee, wouldn't it be nice if I could have lobster thermidor? And it's going to be instead, what do we want? What is the maximum that we can get? How do we work all this together? And in the end, Amtrak is going to be required to report to the Congress on which suggestions that they have adopted, which ones they haven't, and if they haven't adopted something that everybody on the working group wants to have happen, why they're not adopting it. Um, so Congress is going to exercise some oversight on food and beverage and onboard service and that customer experience piece, because it has been clear for years that the customer service piece was kind of getting short shrift. And Congress has said so, certain congressmen have said so in open testimony. Um, and so this was a way to address that issue. Um, dining cars will figure into it. There's always a hardware uh, sort of dimension to this problem. Um, but this is this is going to be much more all encompassing than just, gee, we have these new these new viewliner diners, what do we do with them? And that's a very tactical question. This is going to be that plus menu plus sourcing plus pricing plus getting coach passengers to be able to eat real food. Um, all of those kinds of issues rolled into a, the, the work of the working group. So it, it's a pretty tall order. Right. I mean, the other issue is the great variety based on the train. For example, as you know, I'm a frequent customer of the Lakeshore Limited with uh, relatives both in Buffalo and Chicago. And, um, you know, in my last trip, uh, which was actually a sold out Lakeshore, both in coach and sleeper, um, I'm in my I'm in the dining car and it's me and one other person in the entire dining car for dinner at, you know, six o'clock for dinner and I even said something about is this usual to only have like two people in here and the employee was like well yeah because all the sleeping cars are filled with people boarding in Syracuse Rochester and Buffalo they're not on the train for dinner and we don't allow the coach passengers in because on most trains 
you know, that would, that would put you, you know, like you said, that would create too much demand. So, uh, you know, and the Lakeshore, you're in the situation where at least on train 49 out of New York, it used to be the case where most of the people in the dining car were coach passengers because a lot of the sleeping car passengers don't board until after the dinner hour is over. So, I mean, you know, it was very frustrating to watch all these people coming up into the um, dining car looking for food, looking for dining car food. It was me and one lady at the other end of the dining car. We literally were like 20 feet apart from each other. And yet they couldn't have any, you know, anybody come into the dining car because they're coach passengers. And, you know, I know on the Western trains is a different situation because you got the coat, you got the sleeping cars filled for a longer period of time, but that just gets back to what you said about, you know, each train is different where the Lakeshore is obviously totally different than the California Zephyr where you got people going a lot longer distances. Well, right. And, and there's two things that that brings up. And then I, I'm, I think I can, I think Steve or, or Bruce want us to yeah. move on, to him. but, but yep. two things that that brings up, I think it's important. Um, one is that sounds like a food problem until you really start to pull the layers off. And then you realize that's not a food problem. That's a, a inventory management problem and a computer problem. Because if you could, problem, if yeah. you could, if you could, for example, I'm just making this up, but it, it's something that we have advanced in the past. If passengers getting on in you know, New York or, you know, sort of the, the Hudson Valley type places before you, you kind of go all the way up. If they could order a dinner in advance, get on their little phone when they buy their ticket. Yeah, I want to buy in on dinner and, and, and do that. And you do that in advance. Now I know if I'm catering the train, now I know how much food I got to put on. And now I know what I got to put on. And now I can manage that. And now I don't have to worry about the spoilage so much. So these, these things ripple through. And so if there's an obstacle to doing that, this working group has to examine, kind of drill down and figure out, well, it's not about food. And it's not even about coach. It's about making sure that we can get the right mix of food onto the train so we're not wasting the, the food and the money. And there are ways around that. But there, it's, in that instance, it's a logistical problem and an, and a, and an IT problem. It's not something the chef is going to fix or right. even the food and beverage people are going to fix. It's an right. IT thing. Um, so that's the kind of thing that this group is going to be looking at is, you know, kind of drilling down and finding real answers for, for some of the, the issues that are out there. Um, uh, okay. Steve, thank you very much, Steve. That was very enlightening uh, for everything. Uh, okay. And a reminder to Jim, everybody uh, about, our, about the uh, policy and the meeting and the food. So yes, Bruce. Uh, I just want to ask Jim one or pose one last, perhaps rhetorical question, uh, which I think all advocates need to be aware of. Uh, supply chain issues, which we've heard before earlier today from Amtrak, uh, you know, yes. equipment uh, scheduling and frequency, uh, Amtrak folks told us that is really not so much at this point, uh, certainly not onboard staffing, it's mechanical staffing yep. and parts, parts. We yep. all need to remember parts are the problem. Going forward, though, as we have obviously the opportunity for all this improvement in spending, uh, I certainly have been advocating that, you know, we need to be realistic about what is possible. Uh, the, uh, you know, those in the freight rail industry, and as you know, Jim, I have a direct connection to uh, someone in that area. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the, the idea that all of a sudden uh, you're going to see a lot of construction is not possible. There are not no. construction workers. There is not construction supply. There's not rail steel for rails. There's not ties and everything, That's right. uh, which is not a symptom of the rail industry. It is uh, societal in general. That's uh, correct. So yep. it's... Uh, yep. I would say, I mean, you know, it's rhetorical, but it's not. I mean, that, that's that's actually pretty important to, for everybody to realize. One of the things that I, I sit on in my role in, in, at the association, I'm on a, a Department of Homeland Security task force on the supply chain and the role of the surface transportation network in addressing the supply chain issues. And I'm there to make sure that whatever they come up with doesn't torpedo passenger rail. That's my role as a subject matter expert on, on this panel. But we talk about this. We meet regularly every two weeks. Um, it's it's off the record type stuff. We're not allowed to talk about too much about what we talk about. Everybody's signed an NDA. But I can tell you in general terms that, that yeah, the supply chain issue is enormous. It's enormous. 
it's not just just rail. Um, and these things are going to take a long time to kind of work themselves out. Um, and so there's not enough people. I mean, Amtrak is is I don't know um, I don't know if, if if this was part of the presentation earlier or not, but starting to look at um, uh, recruitment bonuses for people to get into the mechanical department because they're so short. Um, you know, if you can't get the train out the door, it doesn't matter if you got the onboard service guys. Um, and, and oh, by the way, if you want to go work for Amtrak, don't do pot. Even if it's legal in the state you work in, you can't do it because you'll flunk the drug test and then you can't get hired. So don't do that. <laughs> I joke about that a little bit, but all of these things add up. And that's why we are hundreds and hundreds of people short to keep the railroad running and get the equipment out on the road and get the food on the trains and get things repaired and actually spend this money that we've spent 45 years trying to get. Um, so it's a, it's a real challenge for everybody. And I think everybody has to be, as you said, Bruce, I wish people would listen to you more closely. Be realistic, yeah. okay? Um, Amtrak is not sitting there twirling its mustache saying, how can I screw this up this time? They're just not. There's nobody out there to do the jobs and everybody's doing their best. Okay. I think we should uh, move on, Gary. Uh, yep. Jim, I, thank you. Thank oh, you're you, very Jim. welcome. I hope next year we all get to be uh, eating dessert in, uh, in Schenectady. And don't forget the cookies, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. It was great to see everybody. Thanks okay, a lot. Okay, good to see you. Thank Take you, care, Jim, very thank much you. for your time.